Hello, everybody. It is Lady B, and it is Sunday school time. All right, so last week we talked about the crucifixion of Christ. We talked about the different responses to people, um, the different responses of people at the cross, and the response that we need to have. And today we are going to be talking about the fulfillment of the promise that he would be in the grave three days and then be resurrected. And so we're going to be talking about this good news. You know, when I used to work with the um, Sunshine Band right, when I was young and we did this Easter thing. And one of the songs they sang was, have you heard the good news? Jesus is risen. He is alive. Have you heard the good news? Have you heard the good news? Jesus has come back to life again. And I pray that through this lesson, not just for those of us who are believers, I'm praying that I will say something that an unbeliever will come by and, and see this um, channel and see this video, and they too will become believers in the risen Christ. That's what this is real, really all about. Not just for us to be excited and, and, you know, he's alive and sing songs like because he lives, all that is good. But we want to continue the witness and the testimony that Jesus Christ is the living Christ, that he is the Messiah, that he is the reigning king, that he is Lord and he is God. And that's what this is really all about. So let's pray and we're going to get into this lesson. Lord, we bless you. We thank you. We magnify your name. You are so worthy to be praised. We are so glad that you rose from the grave. Your resurrection gives us hope. Your resurrection gives us joy. Your resurrection stands as a representation that we are victorious, even in this life, through you, 
we have the victory. And so we thank you, Lord Jesus. Be with us as we fellowship on today, God. Just speak through me and speak to us all through your word and your mantra saying we pray. Amen. All right. So again, I want to welcome everybody. I want to give a shout out to all the people who have been um, sending in thank yous and, and so forth. Thank you for your giving. Um, I'm not asking for it, but it just means so much that you would actually even want to contribute financially to this channel. I thank you. And I'm praying that the mighty richest blessings of God will rain on you. Welcome also to all of our new subscribers. And I Help me get this out. Share. Um, let somebody know that this little lady, yeah, because I, honestly, I know you can't really tell. Maybe you can't tell. I'm not that tall, but I love the word of God. And if you know someone who is seeking to have the answer, seeking to understand scripture, uh, or they're a Sunday school teacher, and they're just looking for a different insight, please share this channel with them. So today's lesson is the resurrection of Jesus. And we're going to be in Luke chapter 24. Last week, we were in Luke 23. We will be in Luke chapter 24. Our lesson, our Sunday school lesson on today can kind of be summarized like this. And I love this little picture. You know, I love these pictures. I'm a visual person. The cross represents the fact that he died the circle represents the fact that he was buried in the tomb. And then the arrow pointing upwards, he was raised on the third day. And when you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, this is the gospel in a nutshell. You know, I'm really amazed that a lot of Christians, a lot of believers, they can't really tell you what the gospel is. What is the good news of Jesus Christ. It's really, really, really simple that he came and he died and he was buried and he rose again. That's the gospel. We've attached other things to it, like money and 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 and, and going to church and other doctrines, like what you should wear and that type of stuff. But none of that is the gospel. I'm not saying any of that is wrong. I'm not going there. We'll talk about that another time. But the gospel is not the church you go to. The gospel is not the clothes you wear. The gospel is not tithing. None of that is the gospel. The gospel is real simple. The death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what the good news is. The good news is that Jesus finished the work so that mankind could be redeemed back to God our creator. That's what makes it good news. Adam sinned in the garden. And because he is our father, we fall under Adam's nature. And so we are born in sin, as David said. We've been shaped in iniquity. So the first Adam sinned. And then the second Adam, which is Jesus Christ, he provided the means for us to be redeemed back to God, to be free from the curse of sin. That's the good news. And so when we stay with that, just like Jesus said, when he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men. He was talking about being lifted up on the cross. So when we, even as we go through this lesson, this is why I think sometimes we don't get excited about the cross, get excited about the crucifixion, get excited about the resurrection, because we're missing what the gospel is. The gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ finished the work that redeemed man back to God. Because of sin, man, their relationship with God was broken. And then Jesus came and he fixed that. And that is the good news that we now have access, that we now can go boldly before the throne of grace and find the mercy and grace to help. We now can cry out to him, Abba, Father. We now can repent of our sins and be forgiven without having to go to a priest who had to sacrifice animals, who had to go 
into the most holy place. And that's what makes this such good news. That's what we rejoice about, that Jesus, when he said it was finished, it was in fact done. And the way back to God had been made. Anything else is not the gospel. Anything else is 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 not is not the gospel. The gospel is just that simple. He was he died, he was buried, and he rose. That's what you will find in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 if you look at those verses 3 and 4. So if anybody were to ask you what is the gospel, you can show them this or you can tell them well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. And keep it simple. Keep it about this because this is so good. The reliability of the resurrection. Christianity rises or falls on one historical event. And I'm not going to get deep. You know, as I was studying this lesson, 1 Corinthians just kept coming to me. The resurrection is only is only real for our lives today if it is a real event of history. We need for the resurrection to be true. We got to get that. If the resurrection is not true, Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians 15, I believe verse 17, that we are men most miserable, that we don't have any hope that all that we're doing, living right, giving, serving, whatever we're doing, it is a is of no use if in fact Jesus didn't rise or raise from the dead, wasn't raised from the dead. So we must know and understand and believe and then be able to have the evidence that points to the fact that our Lord and Savior was raised from the dead. Now for us we were not there, but there's enough evidence. There was a God made sure that there were enough eyewitnesses of Jesus. They saw him die. They saw him on the cross. They saw him when he got put in the tomb. They knew the stone was on the tomb. And then they saw him resurrected. All of these things are important. Our salvation, our hope, everything that we are as believers, it hinges on the fact, did Jesus rise from the dead? And we must know that he got up. He was raised from the dead. Yes, he was. So let's look at our lesson at a glance. In this lesson, we conclude our unit on Jesus' power over death with the ultimate defeat of this last enemy, Christ's own resurrection from the dead. I, I want to stop there for a second. I did not get into it in our lesson um, with Lazarus when Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, many people, you know, when I heard the commentators saying this, I kind of had to pause. But many people were saying that Lazarus was not resurrected. Lazarus was resuscitated. Now, I'm not saying yeah, nay, but I just want you to hear what I'm about to say. And they were saying that the reason why they would not um, say that Lazarus was resurrected was because he did not get a new body. He still had an earthly body that was going to decay and that was going to die. But Jesus was resurrected and did have a glorified eternal body. Now, the reason why I'm sharing that is because in 1 Corinthians, when it talks about Jesus being the first fruits of those that were going to be resurrected. We are going to be resurrected with glorified bodies. I will still be a woman. I probably will still be short, but I will have a glorified body. I will have a changed body like my Lord. And I don't know about you, but that's good news to me because as I get older and all of these pains start to increase and all kind of stuff starts going around going wrong with this feeble body but there's coming a day when I will get a new body I will have a glorified body like Jesus and so when we talk about here the ultimate defeat yes 
Jesus had been healing and he had been raising from the dead, but all the people that he raised from the dead, they died. They are no longer here. But Jesus, when he got up, he got up never to rise again. The human body that he died with was now changed and it, he's now glorified. He has an eternal body. Now, we won't get into this a lot, but one day it might be in our lesson. But remember, Jesus has an eternal human body. Why? We look at Philippians chapter one. That human body is necessary because he is still our priest. He's still our go-between. And Hebrews teaches us that the sacrifices had to be like kind. That's why the bulls and the goats did not suffice. So Jesus came in human form. Jesus, God in the flesh. He took on the flesh. That's what incarnation means. And so because he is our eternal high priest, he still has that glorified body. And so what he has, John, 1 John 3 says, we don't know, but we're going to be like him. So just like he has a glorified human body, we will have a glorified human body. By his resurrection, Jesus confirmed his identity as the son of God and gave us assurance that we too will be raised with him on that last day. What he did in his earthly ministry assures us that he is God come in the flesh. How does that assure us? Because only God can resurrect himself. He will just as surely return to earth and complete the plan of God. Now, I have this highlighted because I think it's so important for us to remember that the work of Christ, now the work of, of redemption, salvation, us being re redeemed back to God, that's done. But remember, the earth is not done. And 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 what God's dealing with with Israel, that's not done. So God still has a plan. And part of that plan also is to come and get us and take us out of here. Now, I want to say this, because some people think because you believe in the rapture and so forth, you're an escapist. I am not an escapist. I just, I don't believe that we're going to just escape there are people that are suffering for Christ. We may experience suffering for Christ even in the United States, but there's coming a time when the trumpet is going to blow. And those of us, first the dead in Christ, and then those of us that are alive and remain, and we're going to be caught up. We're going to be caught up and meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's what Paul says in Thessalonians. And he also said, he said, comfort one another with these words. So when we talk about the resurrection, there's so much to talk about when we look at all that was accomplished by the fact that our Lord and God proved, demonstrate, demonstrated that he wasn't just Mary's little baby. He wasn't just a prophet. He wasn't just a good man. You know, some people that tell this lie that Jesus came to teach us how to love. That's not why he came. He came to fulfill the will of his father and the will of his father was for his creation to redeem, be redeemed back to him. And that required a sacrifice. And so Jesus gave his life for our life. Jesus took the penalty of our sin. Jesus bore the wrath of God on himself, but he didn't stay there. He conquered death. He conquered the grave. And so as we talk about the resurrection, when you go to your church services and you celebrate the resurrection, remember, it's not just about nice clothes. It's not just about Easter bunnies and candies in the basket, but it's about remembering because we know March 31st is not when he was resurrected, but it's in remembering, commemorating. Some of us will be taking communion. When we take that body, we eat that little piece of cracker and drink that blood. It's to remember that not only did he die on the cross, but he went to the tomb, he rose from the tomb, and he's coming back to get us. And all of those things should come to our mind as we take communion 
on Sunday. So because of this thing, Christ is worthy of the glory and the honor. I want you to think about how a lot of times how we live a lot of times. Some of us, we just live such sloppy lives. I've been guilty of that. And I'm really, I'm really pressing. I've been fasting and praying because when you look at these lessons and you think about what Christ did so that I can be in relationship with God, when you look at the fact that the the, the guilty is being excused and the un, what's the word not guilty or not guilty is being accused and taking on the the, the um the price and 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 the suffering for those who should have deserved it he deserved not just a, a clap me and a hallelujah but he he de he deserves some stupid praise like he really really does Stephen heard have that song undignified praise he deserves undignified praise you know sometimes you know i lead praise and worship at my church you know you look at people a lot of time and people have made worship about them if, if it's not the right song or if the singer doesn't hit the note right or you know or, or, or maybe they're singing the song differently than the way they liked it or the artist sings and all that we may worship so much about us and worship and the glory and the honor is, is supposed to be about the one who came and died and rose and made it possible for us to have eternal life he is supposed to be the focus when we worship all right, so our golden text for today, our golden text is the Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. Luke chapter 24, verse um, 34. And our today's aim is to review Christ's crucifixion and the events that accompanied it. The principle is to recognize the crucifixion of Christ as the historical fact on which our faith is is built and the application is to respond to jesus's substitutionary death with repentance and faith in him substitutionary death that means he is our substitute he took our place he took my place he died in my stead I should be the one, or I should have been the one paying the price, but he paid the price for me. So when you think about the fact that he paid the price for us, how dare we live any other kind of way than a life that glorifies him, a life that pleases him, a life that honors him, not a life that brings shame to him or, or breaks his heart. And I got to challenge us. Let's stop making church and God and everything else about us. It's supposed to be about him. He is God. He is Lord. And we are to follow him. Okay. So now, even today, I was a little bit delayed because I was still wrestling with something. And thank the Lord for my husband, pastor, teacher. He helped me find what I was looking for. Now, let me tell you what I was looking for. There are, when you, when you talk about Jesus, if you say Jesus died on Friday and he rose on Sunday, no matter how you dice that, that's not three days. So that's part of what I was struggling with. And because I had been studying, I knew that, you know, it was Jesus the Passover. And so he had to die the same time as the Passover. And I knew I was I was missing something because the scripture does say that they were preparing for the Sabbath. And so I'm thinking Sabbath would be like our Friday or the weekend. So I have some charts here. I have different ones that I'm going to go through quickly. And I hope it kind of, like my old pastor used to say, my pastor in California say, I hope it stirs your pure mind. And I hope you learn something from it. You may already know it. And you know me, if you have any questions or thoughts, please feel free to contact me. You can send me a message now. I mean, we can discuss it. It doesn't matter. But I, I like to, you know, sometimes we just run into the text and we don't ask any questions and we don't, we're not, we're not making sure that what we're saying is really lining up, is really matching. 
Okay, so let's get into uh, my charts here. Here's the first one. Now, remember that Jesus, John said in, in St. John chapter 1, verse 29, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So now remember, we go, we, um, go back to Exodus chapter 12 with the Passover. Jesus is the Passover Lamb. All right. So the lamb, that the Passover that was instituted under Moses was pointing to it was a shadow or it was pointing to Jesus, who was going to be the Passover. So now here we are. It is Passover time. We know that from scripture. It is Passover time. So if Jesus is the Passover lamb, if he is the eternal lamb, then it has to match. So he had to have been crucified before Friday, Saturday night in order for the other part of the prophecy of like with Jonah, him being in the belly of, of, of the grave for three days. So what that means is, I have more than one. So what that means is Jesus had to have been crucified Wednesday night. Uh, okay, went to the grave. I'm sorry. He was going back and forth with Pilate Wednesday morning. He was crucified uh, Wednesday night because that's when they would have killed the Passover lamb. Okay, and if you see this here, it it it's um you see here night day. See, we think day night. Now I want you to remember that these were Jews. Now the other thing that you see here under Thursday when you see that Nissan 15. All right. You see high Sabbath. And then if you go to Saturday, Nisa 17, it was weekly Sabbath. So when the scripture talks about the women preparing the spices, preparing for Sabbath, they were referring to the Nisan 15. Nisan is the day of um, Sabbath, not the Friday Sabbath. So when you do it that way, then it starts making more sense. OK, so now I hope you can see this one a little bit. So when we look at this one, Nisan 14, the day of preparation before the annual, not the weekly Sabbath. So, again, when the scripture was talking about the women preparing for the Sabbath, they were not talking about the weekly Sabbath. They were talking about this high day Sabbath. So Jesus body was placed in the tomb just before sunset on this Wednesday. And that would coordinate with when the Passover um, lamb was killed. So Jesus was crucified about 9 a.m. Now, you know, we, we know that he was um, 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 on, on the cross and we know at noon it got dark until three o'clock. So Jesus had been on this cross for a little while suffering. All right. And so his body is placed in the tomb just before sunset. And then we have the high Sabbath. And that's the first day of the feast of unleavened bread, which follows the day of preparation. So then he would have been in the in the grave day, night, day, Thursday, night, day, Friday, night, and then day Saturday. And the scripture tells us that early Sunday morning. So that early Sunday morning would have actually been what would have been the day of Saturday. And so early Sunday morning would have been like the night and day of Sunday, which means that's why when the women went to the tomb, Jesus was not there because he had already been resurrected. He had already been in the tomb for the three days. Another way to look at this, you know, the Jews would count half days. We count 24 hours, but they weren't counting 24 hours. So again, we have a half day Thursday, and then we have a whole day Thursday night, Friday, and then we have a Friday night and a Saturday, and then we have a Saturday night, and then which will go into Sunday. And that's why the text would say early Sunday morning. And that's how it makes more sense. If you look at the scripture, that's why it makes more sense about the three days. So when the women got to the tomb, Jesus was already gone. One more here. 
as you can see this again he's entombed shortly before sunset to the beginning of the high holy day sabbath so again there were two sabbaths going on there was the high holy day sabbath and then there was the weekly sabbath and so sometime um and again scholars are not in full agreement of how this works but what we do know is Jesus was not buried on Friday and got up Sunday. That's that's my main thing. We want to be good scholars. We want to really make sure we study the text. So he could not have gotten been buried Friday and gotten up Sunday morning. That would not be three days. Not only that, but because he was the Passover lamb, he would need to be crucified the same time as the Passover. And the Passover was occurring on that Wednesday. And like I said, if you want any of this information, just to review it, just to challenge it or whatever, you know what? I love a good Bible study. I actually love a good debate too. All right. So let's look at the scripture. So now, because in our scripture, and this is why I showed this, when the women get to the tomb, he's already gone. So on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. Um, they're right in their fright. The women bowed down with their faces to the ground. God bless you, Elder Steele. Um, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living? among the dead he is not here he is risen remember how i told you while he was still with you in galilee the son of man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners be crucified and on the third day be raised again then they remembered his words when they came back from the tomb they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others it was mary magdalene joanna mary the mother of james and the others with them who told this to the apostles, but they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. You know, all of us are guilty of not believing the words of the Lord. When the Lord makes a promise and we struggle with it because it just seems impossible, it seems like it's not going to ever happen or whatever. And that's what they were guilty of. And that's why I don't, I like to encourage us, let's not be too hard on the bible characters the people of the bible because they are human just like us and there are times that god tells us some things that, that they're just fan too fantastical they just they too much it's just so hard to wrap our minds around it yes lord we've seen you raise other people but who's going to raise you because you're going to be dead you know we tend to god is in heaven and we tend to relate to him with our limited understanding in our humanity. And I think that's what's going on here. Did they love the Lord? Yes, but they did not have the faith that they needed to believe all that he had said because it was just too much to believe. I think that's the same thing with the rapture when we talk about the Lord Jesus coming back. I just think some people think, oh yeah, right, people just gonna disappear and they're just gonna be gone. I just think a lot of people don't believe it and so they ignore it. even Christians. I think a lot of Christians, they're not even given a second thought about the about the coming of the Lord. You know, they, they don't, they're just living for now. But we need to know, like I said before, this resurrection is evidence that everything that God has promised, he's going to bring it to pass. He's going to bring it to pass. And what we need to do is be ready. Like the, the, the wise um, women that had the oil in their lamps. Listen, we don't know the day or the hour, but he told us he was coming. He told us he was coming like a thief in the night. And so we need to be ready no matter when that time comes. And there are going to be a lot of people. When the Lord comes to get his children, when he blows that trumpet and we are caught up, there are going to be a lot of people that know exactly what happened. They're not going to believe the alien story or anything else. They are going to know that the believers in Christ Jesus were caught up. To, they were raptured up to meet their Lord in the air. And they're going to know that they're about to enter into a very bad time. So let's not be like the disciples. Let's ask the Lord to help us and to increase our faith so that we will be uh, true believers. Now, 
Amen, Elder. I wanted to share this because, you know, it's so interesting. So many people don't believe in the resurrection. And I wanted to share some of the theories there. There's some people said they were at the wrong tomb. Well, you know, they saw where Jesus was buried. They watched they, because remember, the women were planning to go finish what Joseph of Arimathea had started in terms of wrapping Jesus up and putting the spices. You know, they were spice, wrap, spice, wrap. And so they wanted to finish that, but they couldn't do it because of the Sabbath. So you you best believe that these were women. Now, I don't mean no disrespect, but you know, women pay attention to detail. And this was their Lord. So there was no way they had the wrong tune because they were watching all of this. And then some people say it was just wishful thinking. You know, they were just wishing, you know, that he'd be gone or whatever. We know that wasn't it either because they didn't even believe. <laughs> They didn't even believe when they got there and he was gone. They were surprised. They were not believing that Jesus was going to be gone. Some people say animals ate the body. Well, where are the bones? Okay, where, where are the bones? Not only that, but how did the animals roll the stone away? Remember, and I don't know if you remember, the Pharisees in Matthew's um, account, they, they went to Pilate and, you know, these people are going to come and they're going to try to steal the body and say he was raised from the dead. And so they, they, Pilate agreed for them to put the stone in front of the grave. So how did the animals get the stone moved? And then there's some religions that say that Jesus swooned, that he wasn't really dead, that he passed out. Well, the story, the gospels tell us that Jesus, first of all, you got flogged, okay? And it, when he got flogged, he had lost so much blood that he didn't even have the strength to carry his own crossbeam. Remember, Simon of Cyrene carried that. Not only that, but when he was up there, on the cross, when they got ready to break his legs, he was already dead. And remember, he got pierced in his side. And so this 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 sword went into this this sword or spear went into his lungs, and that's where uh, uh, the water was coming from. So blood and water was coming out. So if anything, even if he wasn't dead at that point, by the time he finished bleeding to death, he was going to be dead. There was no way in the world that he just swooned. And then even if he did swoon, he was in this grave, this tomb, this cave-like thing for three days with no oxygen or anything. So he still would have died after he had gotten beat to death. There's no way in the world his physical body would have been able to last. And then some people say it was the grave robbers. <clears throat> some people say that his body was stolen. So again, grave robbers, let's talk about that theory. How could it be grave robbers? First of all, there's a stone that takes several men to roll away. And then the, the, the Roman soldiers were there. And these were brutal people. These were brutal men. And Roman soldiers knew if they failed at their task, it was their life. So what grave robbers were going to be able to overcome these Roman soldiers and take the body? So we know these theories are that, that you know, this is all a result of demonic people that are trying to discourage folk from believing in the resurrection, because if you believe in the resurrection, you're opening your heart up to be saved and the devil doesn't want people to be saved. So I just wanted to share some of these theories that people have said about the resurrection. So our next scripture is, and Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb when the women went and said, hey, you know, the body's not there. And bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. There are many people that believe that what Peter and John saw was, and I include John because of the other accounts, what Peter and John saw was the grave clothes that actually still looked like where Jesus had laid. 
So this was not somebody, you know, that was uh, rescued or any of that. I mean, he, he walked out, which lets us know that his body had been glorified. So the stone didn't have to be moved. He didn't have to be unwrapped because he could, as we know in the scripture, he was, he was disappearing like with the men from Emmaus and so forth, because now his body is glorified and he doesn't have the lim limitations of this earth realm. So all of these things were evidences that Jesus was in fact alive. And when we talk about the stone being rolled away, the stone wasn't rolled away for Jesus to get out. The stone was rolled away for the people to look in so that they could believe. And I want y'all to remember that the stone was not rolled away so Jesus could get out. Jesus wasn't stuck. <laughs> know about you but that's good news to me jesus was not limited by this stone he was not limited by these walls i don't care how thick the rock walls or the lime walls limestone walls were he was not limited it was for us you know so many things god does is so that we will believe that we will hold to him that we will trust him not that he has to do it but he's trying to not trying because God didn't have to try. He's doing these things so that we will believe, so that we will trust him, so that we will look to him. Amen. Elder, he was not limited. So that we will look to him, that we will hold to him, that we will cling to him. That's what this is all about. Because remember, everybody wasn't believing. They looked in there and, and, and they were like, and, and Peter was you know, the Bible says Peter was trying to figure all this out. Unfortunately, they didn't believe the women. Listen, y'all better not not all women, because some of us are silly, but there are some of us we're not silly. And these women, there were more than enough women for them to be like, at least is there any truth in this? Okay. So they did not, because see the scripture says Peter went away wondering. Now the women had already told him, because remember the women had seen the angels and the angels had said, he's not here. Why are you seeking the living among the dead? So the angels had told the women, Jesus is not dead. And yet Peter's here still trying to wonder and figure out because you know how Peter was. That was his personality leaning to his own understanding. So let's look at all the different ways that, um, that God, um, that Jesus revealed himself to the people so that they would believe. So we have the tomb that was visited by the women. That was Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Salome. We have the stone rolled away, allowing witnesses to see the empty tomb. The tomb found empty by the women about the same time, by the time of sunrise. The tomb found empty by Peter and John. The grave clothes arranged consistent with resurrection. Not consistent with, he was swooning and he woke up and, and you know, he was fighting to get the clothes off. No, remember again, he was not bound by the red, the, the grave clothes, which means he would have even passed through the grave clothes without them being disturbed by however kind of way he was, he was wrapped up. And so we got the stone moved and, and the women seen him and, and, and Mary talking to Jesus. Remember Mary talked to Jesus and, 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 and the angel saying he's not there and Peter and John seeing uh, the grave clothes. And then we're going to talk about the men on Emmaus road. This is our last scripture. And when he was at the table with them, now remember Jesus had been walking with these two men. We know one of them was Cleopas. And they were talking about the events, all the things that had happened in Jerusalem with the crucifixion. And remember, the people were sad. The disciples, the apostles, the disciples and the apostles, they were sad because their Lord, their teacher, their rabbi was dead. Again, they did not, even though like what Mary and Martha, you know, yes, I know you are the Christ, the Messiah. They still didn't really believe, believe, believe. They were kind of like us. Like we say we believe, but then when it gets hard, all of that, whatever belief we had, it goes out the window. So they were like us. OK, this was a lot. If I can say it like that, this this was a lot. So even though people are starting seeing now, they still were struggling. So here these men are. They're talking on the road to amaze and say about seven miles away from jerusalem and they just talking about all the things that happened in jerusalem and you know how everybody's feeling and you know they're sad and so forth so jesus joins them the bible doesn't tell us um 
where Jesus came from. But again, remember, this is Jesus. So now he has his glorified body. He is, his work is done so he can come and go as he pleases now. Because remember, he's Jesus, but he never stopped being God. OK, so Jesus appears. He's walking with them. Uh, I, the commentator said this is very common because remember, nobody has cars and stuff. So it's very common for uh, uh, um the travelers to be on the road and to join somebody else. So Jesus joins them and they're talking. So Jesus says, what are you talking about? And they look, you know, man, you ever heard? How the world have you not heard? So they start to tell him all of these things. And so then Jesus begins to expound to them the prophets and, and Moses, the law, you know, and so forth and how all of that pointed to the Messiah. And they still did not know who Jesus was. I believe it was God's will. God had not opened up their eyes to realize that it was Jesus because he wanted to be able to break it all down to them. And so they would be able to connect the dots. So they were enjoying what he was saying. They even said, you know, our hearts were burning within, meaning it was so good to them. And so it was late. And they said, you know, turn in with us. You spend the night with us. And so Jesus stays with them. Well, he says he goes with them. Let me correct that. He goes with them. So when he was at the table with them, this is where our lesson picks up. He took the bread, gave thanks. I'm sorry, let me make this bigger. He took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began um, to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. So again, Look at how God works. He didn't stay. I'm so glad you guys were saved. It's me. Be encouraged. Nope. He wanted their, He wanted them to hear. He opened up their eyes. They realized who he was. And then his work was done. So they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Again, sometimes we are so full of grief that we can't even hear or receive the comfort comfort or grace or the word of the Lord. And so we want to be careful that we're not turning away. Like sometimes we'll be crying, God, I need you to speak to me. And God is saying, I am speaking, but you can't hear me. Just like with Mary, when she thought Jesus was the gardener because her eyes were so full of tears. But then when he called her name, she knew that voice. And so what we want to do, even in pain, even in struggle, even in suffering, God, help me to keep my eyes open. Help me to keep my ears open. Help me to keep my heart open to receive. So they said, we're not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. Now, when they got to Jerusalem, okay, Jesus, Peter, and had already seen the women are already reported. And so now they're all sharing their stories. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 and those with them assembled together saying, it is true. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke bread. So now at this point, Jesus has revealed himself to Peter. He has revealed himself to Mary Magdalene. They have seen that the tomb is empty. So here are some post-resurrection appearances on this Sunday. Mary Magdalene, Jesus tell him he's going to be go caught up. The other women, he instructs him to go tell the apostles to meet him in Galilee. The soldiers definitely know the tomb was empty. Okay. And of course, you know, they were like, don't tell nobody. We're going to pay you for it. And then the two disciples traveling to Emmaus, who didn't believe the report about the empty tomb, but now they do believe. So we know that Jesus had, and I have some other charts here, but we won't go into that. But this, that the, the summary of the four gospel accounts, that the gospel writers make no attempt to mask the differences between the accounts actually argues that there were true valid experiences behind each of them. You know, people like to talk about contradictions in scripture when they, they miss the point. If we all went to the family reunion, we were all at the same family reunion. None of us is going to tell the same story about the same 
family reunion. We're going to include something. We're going to add something. We're going to translate something this way or that way. That does not make it false. A lot of times when people are talking about all the contradictions in the Bible, they really are just looking for a reason not to believe because at the end of the day, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they agree on this one thing specifically, that Jesus, the son of God, got up from the grave. And that's really what matters. So let me finish reading this. There are several similarities in the four gospel accounts. The resurrection took place on Sunday morning. There were women present. The tomb was empty. There were messengers at the tomb. And there were several appearances to the disciples. Now, that everybody agrees on. And that's what we need to stay focused on. All the other stuff, and, you know, Paul told Timothy, don't get bogged up, don't get bogged down. And I'm sharing this because there are so many um, discussions and conflicts about, yeah, but Mark said this and Matthew said that. And so that must not be true. Listen, let me tell you something. Just remember at the family, at, at the family cookout, at the family cookout, you don't get a whole bunch of stories about the same cookout, depending on Hugh's viewpoint you are talking to okay so let's summarize this as we close there were several recorded testimonies to the empty tomb including multiple instances of simultaneous witnesses and at least 11 recorded instances of witnessing christ's resurrected body in the 40 days after the resurrection so jesus was on earth for 40 days with witnesses numbering from one to over 500. You find that in um, 1 Corinthians 15. And three witnesses to Christ's resurrection after his ascension. So God made sure that there was plenty of evidence that those of us who were coming later on would have plenty of evidence that our Christ didn't just come and live. He didn't just die but he was in fact resurrected. So as we close, I want to read these and I'll go through them quickly. Why is the resurrection of Jesus Christ important? This is so necessary. We got to get this. It witnesses to the immense power of God himself. The resurrection of Christ is the measure of his power at work in our lives. Listen, I want to deal with all this, but I'm just going to read through this real fast. It validates who Jesus claimed to be, namely the son of God and his Messiah. His resurrection would be a sign from heaven. It proves his sinless character and divine nature. The scriptures say God's holy one would never see corruption. Remember, Jesus was in the grave, but he didn't stay. So his body didn't decay. Remember what we talked about with Lazarus. Okay, after the fourth day, it was a wrap. Jesus's body did not decay. It validates the Old Testament prophecies that foretold Jesus' suffering and resurrection. It validates Jesus' claims that he would be raised on the third day. His most amazing promise came to pass. So we can depend on and live by the rest of his promises. I don't know about you, but that's good news to me. If he keeps one, he's going to keep them all. Jesus led the way in life after death. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is important as a testimony to the resurrection of human beings, which is a basic tenet of the Christian faith. Without Christ's resurrection, we have no hope. If Jesus hadn't been resurrected, we do need to fear death because that's all that's left. But in Christ Jesus, we know we're just passing through. We're passing through. We are passing through because one day soon, God is going to allow us to cross over into eternal life, eternal happiness, no more sickness, no more disease. You know, we talk about the new Jerusalem, but if we go up with the Lord now, that's, that's, that's already started for us. Okay. The resurrection is the triumphant and glorious victory for every believer. The resurrection is the basis of of our future hope. And then finally, apart from Christ's resurrection, we have no savior, no salvation, and no hope of eternal life. As Paul said, our faith would be 
useless. The gospel will be altogether powerless and our sins will remain unforgiven. I just want you to pause one second. I'm running out of time. Can you imagine your sins not being forgiven? I, I don't know about you, but I need all my sins forgiven. I can't imagine my sins not being forgiven. So I need this resurrection to be true. And this resurrection is true. Just like he was resurrected, I'm going to be resurrected to newness of life, not just my salvation, but eternally I will be with him. The resurrection proves who Jesus is. It demonstrates that God accepted Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf. It shows that God has the power to raise us from the dead. Amen, Elder. We would be in a really bad condition. If our sins weren't forgiven, Lord have mercy. I think we forget that sometimes, how bad our sins are. I, I think we forget. We was, we we still nasty people without Jesus. The Holy Ghost still got to work on us, right? We still being worked on, 2 Corinthians 3.18. So, whew. okay, anyway, I said I'm about to be done here. So the resurrection proves who Jesus is. It demonstrates that God accepted Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf. It shows that God has the power to raise us from the dead. It guarantees that the bodies of those who believe in Christ will not remain dead, but will be resurrected unto eternal life. You know, we are living in a world and a time that men are crazy. Children are crazy. Everybody, because there's no hope. We've taken God out, but that should not be the state of believers because we do have a blessed hope because our Lord, he was resurrected. And because he was resurrected, we will be resurrected too into eternal life. And that is good news. And I want to offer that blessing, that good news to somebody else. But Jesus came and he did die and he was buried and he was resurrected and he did it so that we would be able to be redeemed back to the Father. And all we have to do is repent of our sins. All, that's all we have to do. Whosoever will, let him come. He's not a respecter of persons. If you don't know him, I just want to plead with you. Come to him now before it's eternally too late. And if you do know him, let's live our lives. Let's live lives that glorify him. Let's live lives that give him all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. Lives that make people thirsty. Lives that make people covetous of what we have. That make them come and say, what must I do? to be saved. Thank you all for joining me. I pray that you have a wonderful Lord's Day, a wonderful um, Resurrection Sunday. Thank you for everyone that's joining, every subscriber, every contributor. Thank you for all your donations. Thank you for praying for me. I am praying for you. Have a blessed, blessed, blessed Lord's Day. Bye-bye.